Welcome to Grace Alameda's online service. We're glad that you have joined us for worship today. As we begin today, our call to worship comes from Romans chapter 11, verse 33. It says there, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Our God is great and awesome and above all things. We couldn't possibly comprehend him even if we tried our entire lives. But he has condescended, he's come down to us in Christ. And we have the chance to worship him together today. So let's do that and give him the praise that he deserves. Will you pray with me? Father God, you are over all things. You are utterly unknowable by us, apart from your gracious condescension to us in your word, who is your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us today as we worship with a greater vision of him, who he is, and what he's done. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Your awesome and beautiful 
Welcome again to Grace Alameda. My name is Jeff Locke and I'm one of the pastors here. And if you're joining us uh, for the first time, uh, we would love to hear from you. Please reach out to us. Tell us how we can pray for you and, and how we can connect with you. If you would, go to gracealameda.org contact. There's a link in the description box. Um, and, and let us know that you're watching and we would love to follow up with you. If Grace Alameda is your home, um, this is an opportunity for us to give back to God what already belongs to Him in worship and praise to His holy and good name. Um, go to gracealameda.org give to give of your tithes and offerings to God and support the mission of His church here. After the service, we will be having our Zoom fellowship time. Um, there's a link in the description box. The password was sent out this week. Um, please contact us if you need the password to get on the Zoom fellowship time. And, and we look forward to connecting with you after worship is through. And a quick reminder that uh, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., we will have our regular, our regular morning prayer service. Um, so come, it's 20 minutes at 7 a.m. Um, to, to pray, uh, to hear a little bit of scripture, um, to even sing a little bit, and, and start our weeks um, in, in devotion and communion with our God. Father God, you are our King. And by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, on the first day of the week, you conquered sin. You put death to flight. And you gave us hope of everlasting life. Father, we ask that you would redeem all of our days by your victory. We pray, Father, that you would forgive all of our sins that you would banish our fears, that you would make us bold to praise you and to do your will. And we ask, Father, that you would strengthen us to wait for the consummation of your kingdom at the last day. Father, we ask that you would send down upon all of those in our society who hold public office that you would send upon them the spirit of wisdom, of charity, and of justice. We pray, Father God, that with steadfast purpose, they may faithfully serve in their offices to promote the well-being of all people. We humbly pray, Father God, that you would guide and direct the minds of all those who are called to elect fit persons to serve, especially as an election approaches in just a few weeks. We ask, Father, that you would grant in the exercise of our choice that we may promote your glory and the welfare of this nation. Father, you have made us 
to be in your own image, and you've redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you would look with compassion upon all people everywhere, the entire human family, that you would take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts, that you would break down the walls that separate and divide us. We ask that you would unite us in the bonds of love and peace, and that you would work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on the earth. We pray all these things that in your good time, that all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne in the new heavens and new earth. We pray all of these things in the good and glorious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Psalm 93, 1-5. The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, he has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old, you are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty, your decrees are very trustworthy. The holiness befits your house. O Lord, forevermore. This is the reading of God's Word. Last weekend, my family went down to the central coast of California and had a small getaway. One of the afternoons, uh, we spent at a park right on the beach. Nice day, mid-70s, sun out, and gentle waves just lapping up on the shore. People were uh, playing in the water, lying out on the beach, picnicking on the grass in the park. We were there for about 20 minutes, and within that time, something amazing happened. Very common, frankly, with the California, uh, Northern California and Central California coast. In, in just a span of a couple minutes, a gigantic cloud cover just rolled in and blanketed the whole coast. A chill kind of fell in the air, felt like a 10 degree drop, the wind had picked up and waves were not just rolling, they were crashing upon the shore. People had uh, begun starting to pick up their bags, uh, get, off, get out of the water for sure, um, and even get off the sand and, and, and uh, pack up their picnic blankets uh, and were calling it a day. The beach went from calm to chaotic in a blink of an eye. It's similar to how fast our lives can go from calm to chaotic as well. I can still remember the morning uh, before shelter in place was put for Alameda County. Uh, that morning, my wife and I were still trying to decide whether we should go on a planned trip to Hawaii where our flights and hotels uh, were booked for just two weeks after. And we were still trying to dis discern all that. A couple hours later, by that afternoon, we were making an emergency run to Trader Joe's, stocking up on canned goods and frozen foods, knowing that we were going to have to stay where we were. It's not surprising, right, how fast our lives change. None of us are really surprised that there's chaos in our life or in this world. What's difficult is how crazy it gets sometimes. What's difficult is how quickly things go out of control and how hard it becomes in just a matter of moments. Bob Dylan once said, I accept chaos. I'm not sure whether it accepts me. And that's the reality we're all living in right now, right? This chaos that uh, the world we've all experienced, but it's happened so fast, it's happened so suddenly, and now we're living with it day in and day out. And for many of us, especially those of us who have chaos that's, uh, that goes further, uh, that's much more personal in nature, we're wondering, where is God in the midst of this chaos? How do we have hope when things spin out of control? Our psalmist here in uh, chapter 93 today lives in a world of similar uncontrollable chaos. 
You know, in the ancient Near East, uh, in their writings, in their poetry, bodies of water were often a metaphor for chaotic, deadly, and dangerous situations. We see this here in Psalm 93. You see it in the rest of the Old Testament. 2 Samuel 22, 5 says, For the waves of death encompassed me, the torrents of destruction assailed me. Job 22, 10 through 11, if you know the story of Job, it's about a man whose life uh, spun incredibly out out of control, uh, suffering of all kinds, uh, saying in Job 22, 10 and 11, therefore snares are all around you and sudden terror overwhelms you or darkness so that you cannot see and a flood of water covers you. And that's what this psalmist is referring to, this sense of out of control, uh, the out of control nature of danger that has fall, fallen upon him in, this, in his life. And he even emphasizes it in verse 3 with this threefold repetition of the word flood. And not just that, not just the repetition, but there's a buildup in how these floods work, right? It talks about how the floods have lifted up. And then says again, second time, floods have lifted up their voice. And the third time, the floods have, are roaring. What's interesting about the word roaring here is uh, another way to interpret it or understand it. And you see this in other versions like the NIV. Uh, it talks about not the waves roaring, but the waves pounding, like pounding the way waves would pound a cliffside along the central coast. Isn't that a perfect reflection of how some of us perhaps feel today, in our society today? A relentless pounding of bad news, a relentless pounding of noise and gossip and innuendo and uh, just the anger and frustration and the shouting, just a relentless roaring and pounding upon our hearts and upon our lives that this world is sending upon us. It's eroding our foundations, making it feel like we're on tenuous ground. And for some of us, we're actually in the waters already. We're feeling tossed to and fro by these circumstances and the waves out of control. And maybe this isn't just a 2020 thing. Maybe for you, this is a, it's been my whole life type of thing. You've never felt like you've had control. You've never felt like you've you've been able to have a grasp, a firm grasp on anything. Because everything just feels like chaos. Maybe you're joining us today and you're not convinced of Christianity. But I'm glad that you're here with us and you're watching and you're worshiping. And you're asking and wondering the question, all this talk about chaos, where does chaos come from? Isn't it from God, right? Isn't the, if God's in control, like Christians say he is, isn't it his fault that we have chaos? And that's a valid and important question. How we answer it will help us understand how we can have hope in the chaos. You know, uh, if you look at what the psalmist uh, It's important to note in Psalm 93, uh, as we've looked at verse 3 and thought about the chaos that surrounds the psalmist, but even more so the chaos that surrounds us, it's, it's interesting how what you see is the psalmist doesn't look at the chaos first. He mentions it in verse 3, but in verses 1 and 2, the the psalmist actually sees God before he sees his chaos. In verses 1 and 2, he declares God's majesty, God's power, God's eternal reign. He's proclaiming that God is king over all. In fact, in the last part of verse 1, it says, Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. And what he's referring to or saying there is that the world has order because God is not just any king or any creator, but he's the one who's in control of it all. That's why he has majesty and power and eternally reigns. He's not like the way royalty works in England, where they are uh, figureheads, but don't really exercise any true uh, power or authority anymore. But our God is a God who is in control. And we see this as the testimony of all Scripture. Genesis 1.1, it reads, God created heaven and earth, 
And then in verse 2, immediately after God created heaven and earth, the first thing we, see, we hear about what the earth is like is in verse 2, it says that Genesis 1-2, the earth was without form and void, and that God's Spirit hovered over the waters. And again, thinking about what waters mean, and this term form and void, the, the idea that form, it, it had no form, it had no void, and it was uh, just waters that God's Spirit hovered over, it's all referring to a world that has, is in its earliest stages uh, has no order to it. It's, it's chaotic. But what does God do from verse 2 on? Everything God does from Genesis 1 on is God putting creation together and bringing order into this, form, this formless and, and void world. You know, we live our everyday lives with an expectation of order, don't we? We live our lives with a stability and a predictability to it. But the, the thing that we often forget is that it is God who makes it that way. It is God who has ordered things to be this way. You can expect the sun to rise or rain to fall or gravity to keep us from floating away because God is king over it all. Yes, I fully understand the scientific reasons for it, but it is because God has designed it and ordered it and calls upon the sun to rise every morning and the oceans to crash upon the shore every day. It is because he is king and, and in control of every single thing that that's why it happens. And so when the world is in chaos and it's spinning around, it's not because God made it that way, but it's because when we move away from God, and we choose to live away from his design, things fall apart. Chaos and disorder come from our rejection of God and how he intended us to live. It comes from choosing to go our own way than following him. We see this in Adam and Eve in the very garden itself where their fall brought about a curse upon all mankind and creation. And so that's why we have these natural disasters or these diseases. It's because of the curse that fell upon it when Adam and Eve chose to go on their own way and the way in which we continue in this day to go on our own way. That's why we have the political, uh, the poisonous political discourse that we have today. That's why we have issues with racism today. It's because people are still going their own way, pushing back from the way God has designed and called us to live in this world. But it's not just with diseases and natural disasters. This is why human relationships are broken. Why there's no flourishing in this world. But that's why the pattern of what the psalmist writes here is important for us. That's why for the Christian, in the face of chaos, we don't look away from God, but we look to God. We look to him because he is the God of order. He's the creator of order, not disorder that he's the God who is king and he's eternal in control all the time. We can call out to him because our God doesn't take things apart. He puts them back together. And this is the problem. If you're skeptical about God, if you have questions about his existence, of whether he, he's there or not, the problem is when chaos happens and you're plunged into uncontrollable things, what can you look to? Because you don't start from verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 93. You start from verse 3. You start from the floods rising up, from the pounding and the roaring of the sea. But the thing is, is nothing in this world you're going to cling to or look to or hope from, nothing is ever going to go from disorder to order. Everything in this world goes from order to disorder because things always fall apart. They never rebuild themselves naturally. That's the second law of thermodynamics, it's, it's energy dissipates. Things fall apart in this world. And so if you're trying to organize your life, how many times have you tried to organize your life and all your plans and your schedule, it still falls apart. Because that's how this world is oriented as it continues to fight and kick and push God away. And so if you only can see your life through the lens of chaos and and, uh, and disorder and tragedy and loss, you will never be able to connect those dots back to God. 
because you're trying to go from disorder to order. But if you start from God, who has ordered all things, then in the face of chaos, when you look at it, you can also know that God is in control of it because you know who to look to. And if God is king over chaos, perhaps the challenge for a lot of us, though, is then, maybe I do believe in a God who's in control of all things. But why should I believe that, that God is going to help me? Why should I think that God cares about me? Maybe you're not, a, you're not an atheist, per se. You're a theist or a deist. And you believe that God does exist, but he's probably not too interested in what goes on around here. How can I have hope then that he's going to do something about my situation or this world? Again, another great question and something to really wrestle with. I believe you can hope in God in every affair because our God does not watch chaos from afar, but he draws near to us. And we see this in verse 5. It says uh, how God's decrees Right, are very trustworthy. And what t- typically, we think of decrees in a royal sense, and, and the word being used here makes sense because of the royal theme that's being echoed in this psalm. Right? So we think of commands, uh, we think of a, a calling of some sort that God uh, places upon us. But another translation, again, to think about decrees is also testimonies, and that's used in other versions as well. And we think of testimonies are less as commands or, or, or callings, but testimonies are more stories of promises, pledges, ways in which God is relating to us. And so it's not just that God's commands or decrees are trustworthy, but it's also his promises, his testimonies. The stories told about God are, 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 are trustworthy too. The stories of how those who have found hope in him, they're ones that we can rely on also in the midst of our chaos. I think about Noah and his family huddled in a boat in this ark, rank with the smell of dirty animals, just floating days and nights on end, wondering when rain would stop, when they would find dry land, thinking about the chaos and commotion they were in, and how they had only a hope in God to rescue them. I think about Israelites stuck on a beachhead with a sea before them and the Egyptian army closing in behind them. And think about what kind of danger, what kind of uh, fear was in their hearts as the sounds of horse hooves and chariots rolling up on them with the screaming soldiers of Egypt about to come crush them and only a sea of body of water before them, how were they going to make it out? The good news is that the testimony that these different stories have is that God met them in their chaos. Because Noah and his family, their ark found dry land. And the Israelites watched in wonder as the seas parted and walls of water formed and they walked through the sea on dry ground. And in both cases, uh, they, after they completed, after they were rescued, both parties, Noah and uh, his family and the Israelites, they worshipped God for delivering them. Friends, these aren't just stories in the Bible. These are the stories of our people. We are one with them as the people of God. They are our people because their God is our God. The same God that has delivered them from the flood and from the the Red Sea is the same God that will deliver us from COVID, from racism, from the brokenness of the world we live in now. And in fact, perhaps an even greater testimony is the whole Bible itself how it's a book and a testimony of how God deals with chaos, how God is bringing order into his world. I mentioned earlier how in Genesis 1, God created it. In the midst of creation, everything he did was to take things from disorder and to bring order to it and to make sense of the chaos and to show that he was in control and that he lovingly uh, cared for his creation. 
And I also mentioned how Genesis 3, Adam and Eve tore that apart, ripped it asunder, and, and wrestled control from God. And how everything since then has been pushing God away and bringing chaos into the world, making disorder happen, things falling apart. Jump to the very end, Revelation 21. The vision that John receives of the end of all things when Christ appears. And it says this in Revelation 21.1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the sea was no more. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 3, heavens and earth are broken. They're cursed and destroyed and corrupted because of Adam and Eve. Revelation 21, God brings about a new heavens and new earth. The sea, the flood, all the water, and all the ways in which it represents the death and destruction of God's people, the chaos that is brought into this world. Revelation 21, the sea was no more. This, obviously, this isn't saying God doesn't care about beaches or oceans. It's a metaphor for God, for, for, uh, for God who gets rid of all the chaos, who brings order to all things finally and fully, such that there will be no evil or destruction anymore. God redeems and perfects what was broken, and there will be no judgment. There will be no death. And the thing is, is God knows our chaos. He's not just Lord over all these things. God knows our chaos. He knows our disorder. And he's done what it takes to save us from it. Because perhaps the most trustworthy testimony of all is Jesus Christ himself, his very son. Hebrews 1, 2. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is his very testimony. 2 Corinthians 1, 20. For all the promises of God, all his uh, decrees of God, his testimony of God, find their yes and amen in Jesus. Because in Jesus we have a Savior who had power over all the chaos. Because while Noah and his family had to wait out a storm in the ark, Jesus himself commanded wind and the waves to be still. He didn't have to wait for a storm to stop. He told it to stop. While Israel had to have a sea parted for them, so that they could walk on dry ground. Jesus walked on the water itself because he stomps the waves of chaos to its grave. And even more so, it's not just that Jesus demonstrates his power over all these things. Jesus also demonstrated his willingness to enter into our chaos. That even with his divine power, he knew us in our weakness and suffered in our chaos. And the picture of that is the cross. Jesus, overcome by the waves of death, that he would be crucified and drown in our sin. Suffer our curse that we deserved. To be torn apart at the cross for us. You know, death, if there is anything uh, that is the most chaotic evil in the world, it's death. It's the most abhorrent disorder there could possibly is. Nobody looks at death and goes, that's the way the world should be. But at every funeral, we all feel that gaping hole and pit in our stomach where we cry out and know deep in ourselves, this is not right. This is broken. And yet death comes to all of us. But most importantly, death came to Christ. Jesus died for you and me. He experienced our chaos. He experienced our disorder. And yet the good news of the gospel is that he was resurrected because our God takes disorder and brings order to it. And the resurrection is proof positive that our God can make all things new. That he can be our hope in chaos. Because our God doesn't just see what's going on He's lived it. He's Lord over it. He's been through it. God is not watching and waiting for us to see how this all turns out. Like some mad scientist in a lab experiment. 
He's using this time. This time of chaos. This time of craziness and disorder. It's a time where we have a chance to draw near to Him. To look to Him first. To hope in Him. To bring us closer to Jesus. You know, every human attempt to bring order to chaos is an act of spiritual entropy. Because what we'll find ourselves doing is we'll be drowning in the noise and craziness of this world the more we try to make it work on our own. We'll continue to be pounded by the waves of confusion, waves of disappointment, and waves of frustration. Look to Jesus and find an eternal king who can bring order to your chaos, who graciously walks with you in this time and brings hope in the midst of the chaos of this world. Let's pray. Lord, you are the God who is over all the craziness that we are going through. The Lord, you're king over the chaos. And we, we give praise because you're not just the one who stands by and watches it all with glee. But Lord, you loved us so much and loved to, to you love changing and redeeming and, and fixing your people so much that God, you sent your very own son to walk in our chaos, to live in our chaos and to suffer the disorder and brokenness of death for us. And so we give praise and thanks that the glory of the resurrection is not just his hope as he has lived it out and now is at your right hand, but it's our hope now that God, there is a hope one day that things will no longer fall apart, but they will be brought together and put back again. So Father, especially for those that are suffering and struggling and feel like their lives are spinning out of control, who feel like they're just losing things left and right, and are not able to live in the world that they had hoped to live in. God, would they look to you and find that you make all things new? Would you make that promise true to them? Would you help them to see Jesus in the midst of their chaos? That they would see you first before they see the craziness of their own lives and hope in you alone. Father, I pray that for all of us in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our confession of sin comes from Romans 11, 34, 35, and it reads this. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? It's easy in our chaos to forget about God and try to fix things ourselves. But if you're like me, then you know that the more I try to fix things, the more they fall apart. The more they fall apart, the more bitter angry and depressed I get, and the bigger mess I make, and it all moves me further away from God. Are you trying to do what God already can do? Are you trying to be in control of your own chaos? Now is a time to confess and to repent and to look to God before you look to your chaos, and to know that he is with you, and he's the God who can bring order to your disorder. So let's take some time in silent prayer and meditation and go to him and look to him in hope. Let's pray. Our assurance comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The good news of the gospel is that anyone who calls upon God's name will be saved. That's his promise to us. So it doesn't matter who you are or what your story is or where you're from. But God delights when you put your trust in him in every aspect of your life. So as you see him and hope in him in the midst of the chaos of this world, worship, rejoice, sing his praise. He's Lord over all and he's Lord over you. Let's worship 
in response. Holy, uncreated one, your beauty fills the skies, but the glory of your majesty is the mercy in your eyes. Our benediction today, God's blessing to us, his people, comes from Romans chapter 11, verse 36. 
It says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. God is our creator, sustainer, and he is the ultimate goal of everything in heaven and on earth. By his grace, he has welcomed us into his eternal plan to unite all things in Christ. May we this week go forward submitting to his authority in our lives and giving him the praise that he deserves. God bless you and have a wonderful Sunday.